The Chuck Knox Show. Don't go to bed Mondays without it. And we are live. Welcome back, Giants fans, to another edition. The next episode of The Chuck Knox Show on this April 1st, April Fool's Day edition. We have a lot to cover. And before we do it, of course, The Chuck Knox Show is brought to you by BetUS.com. Click the link. You help out the channel. You know how it works. And, folks, let's just get right into it because it's been a long... It it feels like free agency has been going on for a month. And it's really been about two weeks or so here. But really, I mean, the first few days, it's done after that. Once Once the big moves are kind of... In the first 48 hours or the first 72 hours, everything just kind of trickles down after that. And, you know, really the Giants have money left to spend. But for the most part, you're going to get, you know, middle, bottom tier kind of players right now as they wrap up free agency. And, you know, look, if I had to give the Giants a grade right now, and if I had to be a B plus, it's because, only because the offensive line you lost more in the offensive line than you gained. And, of course, that was a need. Uh, I'd say a B-plus, A-minus, somewhere there for the Giants. Uh, Absolutely been, I'd say, top five that Joe Shane and company have done here. Uh, Very impressive free agency. And, really, this one is, I'd say, more important because last year you had to deal with remnants of Dave Gettleman, you know, the roster, the, the previous incarnations of the Giants uh, roster. You had to poke holes all through that, dismantle a lot, and and find out the pieces you needed to quickly put around this team that you didn't really build. And now, you know, after one year under your belt, you had this surprising playoff run. You had this, you know, nobody believed in you. You got, you got to the second round of the damn playoffs with a roster that you didn't even want. So this was a very important free agency for Shane and really to see the roster and the type of team that these guys, Dave's and everybody wants to, you know, build. And we're really starting to sink our teeth into it. And it's been an incredible off season. If you look around the league right now, I mean, the giants retain both coordinators, Kafka and, and week Martindale, which was huge because you look at in this division alone, everybody swapped out coordinators. The Eagles lost both of them. The Cowboys fired their offensive coordinator uh, the the Redskins went through the Commanders went through their own their own changes that they made and their their coaching staff. So the Giants are the only one with the continuity to come back and say this is the same team, the same group of guys, and we're going to build off of what we just started in, in year one. And part of that, of course, is going to be just the, the roster itself having to completely shape and mold this into to the Dave's and everybody's vision. And I have to say, right off the bat, you know, the Giants' first big move was bringing in, signing Indianapolis Colts linebacker Bobby Okereke. You get a guy like this guy, a tackling machine, a run-stopping machine, to be there in the middle, in the inside. And the biggest problem the Giants had last year is you really, you couldn't adequately use your pass rushers, which we have a lot of them. But when you're getting just demolished in the run game over and over and over again. The Giants had a lot of uh, second and two, you know, second and three on defense because they just got gashed. And you hope that Okereke can step in and immediately fill that role because if you can have a run stop, a nice run stopper right there, boy, it's going to free up these pass rushers. And uh, I, I consider this probably on par as equally as big as the next move we're going to bring up here. But Bobby Okereke coming in here on a four-year, $40 million deal, or roughly around $22 million guaranteed. And so this was a big, you know, splash for Shane and company because this was also a position in need and a guy that they have not a type of caliber of player that you haven't had in years here. So we start off with him. I think that's very important for the Giants to set the tone of free agency, and really the 2023 season. And, of course, next, the, the obviously maybe the biggest move of the offseason for the Giants, certainly the, the biggest headline, was the Giants traded 
They traded basically the, the Kadarius Tony picks and a shocking move to the Las Vegas Raiders for tight end Darren Waller, who really acts like a number one receiver. So you got a guy, you're bringing in a guy that for when he's healthy is a top five tight end and, and a top 10 weapon in the National Football League. A stunning, really a stunning move from the Giants. And also, you know, what you gave away, practically nothing, to bring in a guy of his caliber. Now, you know, the knock on Waller is that he's been hurt the last two years. He had about a three-year window where he was pretty damn dominant. And, of course, you know, building on that relationship with Derek Carr. Uh, so you have a guy that now can be the the blanket, if healthy, can be the go-to target for Daniel Jones. You put a guy like this at tight end, of course, with Bellinger and this offense, uh, man, you're, you're talking about an entire different dynamic for an offense that had to struggle last year with the pieces around them to suddenly have a guy that can set the whole tone right there at tight end and run an entire different scheme. The offense will look very different this year. Can't cannot understate how big of a move the Darren Waller trade is. And it, look, you look at the the headlines and the reaction around the league. This shook up some people because this is a guy that, if you're paying attention, especially for fantasy players, huge move, absolutely huge move for the Giants. And the Giants, you know, really we were not done there. That was the two big splashes. But the next thing, you stay on the go back to the defensive side of the ball here. And your Giants bring in Raheem Nunez Rochez. Another guy, a run stopper, big body, right up the middle. You're trying to plug that hole. So obviously the Giants go into the offseason looking at these glaring holes that they had. They had two things that they really wanted to focus on. On two sides of the ball. One was, of course, the, the glaring hole of the inability to stop the run on the defensive side of the ball. So right there, you start sealing up. You're bringing in some guys to seal that up. And then, of course, and we'll get to this in the next uh, minute here, is speed. They wanted guys that had speed and the receiver position and that could get separation. And, and we'll get to that, but they did that. But anyway, they bring in Nacho here. Uh, another good signing. I, uh, I think this guy's great. I think his personality, his character is perfect for this locker room. It's perfect for a, a, a Wink Martindale defense. And uh, you really having another body down there. That's going to do nothing but free up these pass rushers. So another good move, another good signing. And we're going to go over the, the free agent signings and not the re-signings here first. So well, those are your three guys here. Of course, Waller was a trade. Next up, the Giants go back to the offensive side of the ball. And this is where we talked about just a second ago. Wide receiver position, speed, and separation. That is what Paris Campbell of the Indianapolis Colts comes in on a one-year $4.7 million deal, and really, this was a no-brainer for the Giants, a guy that you can just you know test out, see what happens year and year one in this offense, but a guy that is a reliable target. Uh, I would say very similar to Darius Slayton as far as numbers go, but, but Campbell's got a speed burst in him that could be very, very productive for this offense. I like the fact that he's a upgrade over a guy like Richie James, so uh, I like this one a lot. We were not there done or done there in the wide receiver position yet. The, then the Giants bring in on a one-year deal, on a really a vet minimum deal, Jamison Crowder uh, recently of the Buffalo Bills. And, of course, Jeff Smith, who's been all over, but another one-year deal, uh, wide receiver from the Jets. Now, all these guys, clearly the vision was we sucked at speed. I think the Giants were like uh, bottom three or near the top bottom five of separation and speed skill sets uh, for the in the NFL. Might have even been the worst in the NFC, if not the worst, period. So clearly the Giants all over this on the offensive side of the ball. And those additions right there, the wider series we just named off, Campbell, uh, Crowder, and Smith, that was it as far as bringing in new guys at the wide receiver position. The Giants do bring in a few more here to address the defensive side of the ball. Two cornerbacks, Giants signed Bobby McCain of the Washington Commanders, one year, $1.3 million deal. Uh, you know, just an average body, 
Same thing as bringing in Amani Orwarie. I don't even know if I pronounced that right. From the Lions, similar deal there, uh, 1.2 million. Now these guys, you know, just you're going for depth. You're just you're looking at depth here in Wink's defense right here. But you know, cheap signings. Um, we need bodies in, uh, in the cornerback position, the secondary. I would say still needs to be addressed. Probably going to be addressed in the draft. But I, I like that signing. I like the McCain one more than the Amani signing. You talk to Lions fans; they were pretty happy to get rid of him. But we'll see. Maybe a change of paint in this offense or in this defense can change things for Amani. And I think the last uh, free agent signing the Giants had. And I think those were the two, the last two signings the Giants had as far as free agent signings. Then it was about taking care of our own, and or not taking care of our own to a couple players. And first of all, we'll go through the guys that we re-sign. Most notably, of course, Darius Slayton, who had a better deal on the table for the Atlanta Falcons, but you know he's very close to Daniel Jones. This guy loves to be a giant. I love this guy. I don't like the drops, but I think he's he's just a great giant. He, he embodies everything you'd like to see about a giant. But Slayton comes back here on a two-year deal, $12 million. And he's a guy, again, he's, he's one of the most reliable targets for Jones. Jones and him have probably, hands down, the best connection of any wide receiver that he's had until this point. So he, I, I applaud the Slayton signing. I liked Slayton coming back. Because if you if you would have lost Slayton, you know you're looking at a wide receiver other than Hodgins, which we all we will get to that now. He's also resigned one year deal. Hodgins is back, probably my favorite wide receiver of last year. So you bring in Slayton and Hodgins are back, and so you start adding more depth and more bodies. The wide receiver position looks a lot different. I don't even think we're done there yet. We know probably spending wise and free agency we're probably done. And we'll nail out the draft as we get closer to it and, and knock out all the scenarios there. But I, I am somebody personally that would be stunned if the Giants don't go wide receiver first round of the draft. Because on paper here, you have a two, you have maybe two, a two, a three, you know, a couple threes. And you still, if Waller pans out, that's going to be your top target. But a, a number one wide receiver still not present on this roster. Does that mean you have to have one, though? No, it doesn't. I and mean, you look at the Chiefs this year, their offense was ran through Kelsey. And in a similar style, you look at the paperwork right now here on paper, the Giants have a similar type of offense right now, potentially being suited and going right through Darren Waller in the tight end position. We also brought back, and a guy that I've, Really been impressed with our backup running back, Matt Breda. Uh, One-year deal as well. $1.4 million deal. N you know, not, it's a smart signing. I like the change up in pace when Breda came in, filling in for Barkley, and just a one-two punch. Very reliable uh, back. He runs hard, hangs on to the ball. I really like that signing. Um, the, mo almost all of the, the mid-level giants that I thought were key to, or possible names that you'd want to retain, pretty much all have been retained. And then I believe that the only other name that we retained on the defensive side of the ball, uh, as of right now, is Hadi. Jihad Ward comes back, one-year deal, $1.5 million, slight increase from what we had last year, and I think he deserves it. Here's another guy. These guys love playing with Hadi. He brings that veteran energy that you definitely need, that a team like this definitely needs. And personality-wise, you look at guys like him and, and bringing in a guy like uh, Nacho and Okereke with the personalities that we already have with Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams and, of course, KT on defense. These are, these are strong personality locker room leaders part of this culture, and I, I really like the fact that we brought back Ward. And that was pretty much all of the retaining Giants. And then here we have lost, uh, now depending where you stand, we lost three names that I consider one to be um, a decent loss, maybe you know the only real loss that we had this offseason. But the biggest loss for the Giants, of course, is Julian Love. The Julian Love... It's almost like a 
warning to Giants free agents going forward. You know, uh, Saquon, you know, when, when we sign, when we franchise tagged Saquon, the message was was pretty much clear. They, the offer was on the table three times. You thought you could get it somewhere else. You couldn't. So you forced Shane's hand to use the franchise tag. And with Julian Love, we've learned it was very similar. Giants had an offer to him back in the fall. Turns out it would have been more than what he got here in Seattle. He did, by the way, sign a two-year deal with the Seattle Seahawks. Two years, uh, $12 million. And then at the end of the season, right before the start of free agency, they tried one more time to negotiate with Julian Love. They thought they could get more elsewhere and like many other positions, we have seen that there's just a cap here, and Julian Love found out the hard way. But the tone, probably for the entire Joe Shane era of general manager of the Giants, was set with this signing. Like, look, the, the offer was on the table. We put it here. Julian Love comes back after turning down two offers for the Giants. Comes to back with the offer from Seattle. Says, hey, here it is. And, you know, they offered less. Will you guys match it? And the Giants chose not to match it. And, and look, I mean, Julian Love on the field. I just recently put out my top 15 plays on the defensive side of the ball from last season. And Julian Love is all over this video. And, and a lot of this, he's a very smart football player. Very f- smart, high football IQ. And he was in the right place at the right time in Wink's defense. There's also a lot of glaring holes in Julian Love's game. This was by far last season his best season. Contract year for the Giants. He becomes a captain, and I think he really excelled in Wink's defense. And I would have liked to have seen him progress going forward as a captain in this defense. But really, what this move says to me is that we prioritize, as we should, Xavier McKinney next year coming off the books more than you. And quite frankly, we believe that we can make guys like Dane Belton, who are sitting there ready to go, uh, you know, just kind of plug him into this role and and do exactly what you did. Whether that's going to happen, that remains to be seen. But I think the Giants... And the coaching staff feel confident that Julian Love was just, you know, whether you like it or not, isn't that important of a piece. I wish him nothing but the best because it, it was it sucks, right? It's a business. It sucks. This guy personally, his personality and everything, his character, this guy's a giant. He wanted to be a giant, but he blinked. And, you know, the Giants didn't. So there goes Julian Love off to Seattle. And the other two big losses, and I say big only because it left a position wide open. You lose Nick Gates. Nick Gates goes and signs a three-year, $16.5 million deal with the Washington Commanders and also losing uh, John Feliciano, a one-year deal, $2.25 million with the San Francisco 49ers. So Giants, in a sense, lost both centers. and uh, Two locker room guys, two leaders. I like both of these guys. I like them as people as men I'd love to play for these guys everybody knows Nick Gates' story phenomenal, one of the greatest comebacks, probably the greatest comeback we're ever going to see here in New York for the Giants in our lifetime this guy was, they didn't know if he would walk again they feared for his life his, his way of life and he made it on the field again in a year so that story is incredible but going forward You know, Nick Gates and and John Feliciano center was probably still going to be a position that the Giants would ultimately draft their future somewhere early in this draft. And that's where I still feel. I still feel that the Giants, within the first three rounds, they're going to get a center. And right now, you know, everybody's kind of panicking, like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? They like Lemieux a lot coming back off an injury. So Bredesen or Lemieux... So you have to believe, you know, that position and still the offensive line likely to be addressed in in, uh, the draft. But, you know, we'll see what happens come camp, come June. There'll be some some veteran cuts after June. I'm assuming that Joe Shane 
is keeping some, you know, pocketbooks in his hip because he's in his in his checkbook here. Because I don't I don't necessarily think he's done filling out this roster. But I, I, I like every bit of these moves. Uh, there's nothing I can sit here and bitch about. There's nothing that I don't think was a necessity to do, a necessity to be made here for this team going forward. Like I said, like Julian Love a lot. I like all three of the guys that we lost. I like them more as people than I do as players. So to me, that says that was the right move. I agree with it. Clearly. Of all the teams, and I'm biased as shit. Everybody knows that. But I think of all the teams in the NFC East, who can you say is uh, headed in a higher trajectory? Philly lost an enormous amount of players in in free agency. They lost 20 or 30-some sacks alone just between two or three guys. Use your interception leader, your best running back, your two quarter, your two coordinators. Dallas is very old. They they had a great offseason, though. I think they made some some good trades. And in Washington, you don't really know what to think because they're in complete rebuild mode. But I think the Giants, coming off the year that they had, the roster that they're building right now, the future is very bright. It, it, it's, it's insane to think we are here already where we're building a team that needs to go further, not get in the playoffs, but go further. And, of course, that starts with winning your damn division games, Philly and and Dallas especially. One one splitting them would be great, but I, I tell you, it, it would make me so fucking happy if this team can sweep this division this year. But before we can talk about that, you know, we have to win at least once. We've been getting our ass kicked by these two teams for too long in the easiest path back to the playoffs, and everybody knows it, is win your division. You handle your stuff in-house in your own division, and the rest will will fall into place. It always does. One of the biggest questions that I continue to get about free agency, I probably get asked this uh, every two days, of course, is Odell Beckham, OBJ. And I don't think there's many content creators out there that want like the and who's open about wanting OBJ on the Giants more than myself. But I think it could be time to put that away. I think the Jets have the most to spend on him. Seems like a you know he wants to be in New York. He's gonna the the idea of catching passes from a 39 year old ayahuasca addict has really intrigued OBJ. Obviously, because the Giants, who once again this week, between Mara's comments and Dable's comments, are interested and in communication with OBJ, but they just don't have, you know, they don't have, they're not pursuing him the way these other teams are. And with OBJ, that sometimes means a lot. And I think the the Jets have really kind of honed in here and tried to create this as the best landing spot for Odell. And, And if it is, good for him. You know, I, I think this team has plenty enough right now to compete. Getting a guy like OBJ would be a luxury. You know what I mean? Like, we're at this point, we don't know what we're going to do in the draft. I still think we're going to go wide receiver in the draft. We may even move up, which may surprise some people in the draft to get a wide receiver. So if it happens, it's great. I don't believe it's going to happen. I don't allow my mind to think that's going to happen anymore. It was a great story. It would have been a great finish to his career, and and even Saquon and Sterling Shepard, these guys are all best friends. It would have been a nice bow on that, but it wasn't meant to be, and we we don't need him. I don't think that we need to give up a ton of shit either for somebody like Hopkins. A lot of people wanted that or or Judy. It would have been nice, but not for the price that they're offering. We, We need these picks now because we landed in an amazing spot where we're competing, we're on the verge of, of going deeper in the playoffs, but also rebuilding at the same time. And we're fortunate enough to have, you know, a roster that that doesn't need as much as maybe somebody that's rebuilding like Washington, say. So I think that OBJ thing is done. Unless something really crazy happens over the next month or so, I you know, I, I imagine that we're the first team meeting here, uh, I think in two weeks here in April. 
if there's not movement, if you're not hearing something from the Giants on that, because I think they would like to have him in there. I think they'd like the bulk of that roster in here by mid-April. So if there's going to be a big splash or if their intentions are there, you're going to know about it. But I, I'll just be surprised, put it that way. The other big news, I guess, that you could say big news, that's come out here in the last week is that the Giants' MetLife has officially changed the worst turf in all of sports. Uh, an act of miracle, a miracle from heaven. As the Giants finally made the switch, they have a new turf. It's going to be from the company called Field Turf. And this is Field Turf Core, which is used by, uh, I think, three other teams in the National Football League right now. The the Falcons, the Lions just switched. Um, I know the Patriots have had it, and I believe the Panthers have a version of Field Turf. And, you know, I, I uh, put out the statistic. There's two of these teams are in the bottom of injuries since they've switched. The Patriots are around the middle ground, around 15 or 16. And not saying that that has, you know, every injury is an indication of the turf. But you also look at the statistics, and they don't lie. Stats don't lie. The Giants have had the most injuries in the NFL since 2009. Now, the Jets have had an enormous amount as well. They play in the same piece of shit turf but nobody has had more wins basically taken from them than the Giants have which you could attribute to injuries as we don't want to make excuses but they are you know it is what it is so this is very exciting because it's a step in the right direction and what it also shows is this new leadership and I'll throw the Jets in on this too because there seems to be a, a new uh I don't know. It's like synergies running through MetLife here. Both franchises seem to be just kind of going in directions that they normally would not go. I don't know if that's because both ownerships are, are you know, getting older and maybe their window to see another run is, is closing and they're willing to take the, you know, their hands off of the reins here and change and not be as stubborn. I don't know. But you look at the way the Giants, and I'll only talk about, you know, our side of the locker room. But, but you look at the way that this entire organization has been shifting in the last year, you know, bringing in guys like Dable, uh, Joe Shane, and, and Wink Martindale, and, and some of these players, you know, the culture is, is completely different. There's a different energy all over MetLife. So there's, this can only be positive, but again, the proof's in the pudding, and uh I'm excited to see what happens. I'm not one of these people that just constantly thinks it's the turf. I think a lot of it is also, and I don't want to throw uh, Barnes under the, and the training staff under the bus, but, I mean, how can you have, how can you lead in these categories every single year and it not be a complete overhaul and do nothing about it? But that's what happened until basically in the last year. So thank God somebody has finally done something about it. And maybe we can go in the right direction now. Maybe we don't get guys blowing out ACLs at the blink of an eye. A lot of changes. There's, I mean, from the turf to the sidelines, we, we've been creating a lot of changes. And change is good because we're changing in the right direction. And before you know it, you know, it's going to be all, it's going to be draft. It's going to be training camp. And then we're going to be right back into it and look. It's going to happen fast. But before we get out of here, I asked Giants fans uh, various social media platforms if they had any questions. So here's a QA. Let's do a QA here. Uh, there's a few questions that I'll get to. I couldn't get to everybody's because some of these came in after I'm recording this, this podcast. So, so let's get to a couple of them. These are the ones from Facebook. By the way, Facebook.com slash Mr. Chuck Knox. That's where you're going to find me every single day. And, of course, Twitter, uh, at Chuck Knox, where these questions were submitted. So let's go. First question here is from, this is from Les. Les said, why are we not doing anything to address the O-line, which is projected to be dead last in pass protection? And he goes on to say, I'll be listening to the podcast. This is the best Giants page out there. Thank you very much, Les. Uh, I really appreciate that. That's awesome to hear. Uh, As far as the question goes, uh, you know, I think I covered this uh, um, earlier, but I do think the Giants, that's why I dropped them to maybe a B plus because the offensive line really wasn't addressed 
at all in free agency. You lost before more than you gained. So that can't be ignored. You know, look, I don't know uh, why the Giants did not seem to address and be as aggressive with the offensive line as maybe we thought that they would be. Um, you know, these guys are very thorough in their offseason evaluations. So the fact that they didn't feel this was as pressing as maybe some of us did, our you know, fans, it's telling to me. It's not concerning because I just feel like they know what they're doing. But I, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I think the Giants look at their draft, and if you look at they have two tackles who could potentially be cornerstones and Thomas and if, if Neil pans out, which I, I still believe he will. And I think that if you look at what they're doing, they're they're building a very young offensive line. And I think that's mainly because they want this unit, this core unit, to play together as a unit, you know, for, for years to come. And if you look at the, any time that in, in the Giants, just our success in the last two Super Bowl runs that we had, I think when the Giants have a cohesive line that's been together for multiple years, and I think that goes across the board, that's when you really get the best play, right? So I would assume that's a strategy. There's really not much out there offensively that or that they could have gone free agent-wise and blown a lot of money on anyway. So I, I, that's just my guess. Giants are going for a cohesive unit being built through the draft. And I guess we're going to find that out here in a couple weeks. Next question was from Nick. How effective do you think Sterling Shepard will be this season? Um, I didn't cover that in this podcast, but Sterling Shepard, of course, also has been re-signed to a one-year deal. One of my favorite Giants. I, I talk about this guy all the time. I love this move. I love bringing Sterling back. I think he'll be a Giant for life in any capacity. But I, my gut tells me this is probably a situation where they want to see if he can play one more time. You know, one more time, he probably wants to see if he can do it. I don't think Sterling Shepard's going to be ready for for Week One. So, what do I expect from him? I expect I expect him on the field and I expect him to contribute. Uh, but I, I, you know, who knows? This is a lot of injuries in the last few years. I think the guy is an incredible athlete. I think he plays so hard with a ton of heart when he's out there. And I think that the Giants will find a way to ease him in this season. And I think with the guys that they've kind of added around him. You can kind of give him a couple games to kind of get his, you know, get up there and get to speed. So I expect Sterling Shepard, if he's on the field, he's going to be Sterling Shepard. But, you know, this could be the end of the road as far as him as a as a down playing, you know, wide receiver. So we'll see. I have high hopes for him and a long career, hopefully, in some capacity for the Giants. And one of the other, and I got this question at multiple times, so I'll just answer this one. What Dustin asked, "What do you think we should do in the first and second round of the draft?" So uh, I've said this, I guess, a couple times in this podcast. I do think the Giants go wide receiver at where they're at in the first round. You got Addison from USC and Flowers from uh, Zay Flowers from Boston College, likely going to be there at twenty-five, likely going to be there where they're at. But I think they could potentially move up. If you look at some of these teams that are in front of them, they likely need a wide receiver as well. Wouldn't shock me to see the Giants move up a couple spaces and, and spots and get a wide receiver. Unless those guys are there, or unless those guys are off the board in the at the bottom of the first round, I just can't see them going anywhere else but wide receiver. But I think if they're off the board, I think the Giants go cornerback um, in the first round. And or vice versa in the second round, either a cornerback or they're going to get their offensive line help, I think, in the second round. I think the Giants in the first three rounds hit a position, uh, you know, that we need. I'd say wide receiver, offensive line, cornerback. And that's where I think we're going. I think those first three picks are going to set the tone. Would not be shocked if the Giants try and move up here in the first round. But we'll get through all of the the draft talk later this uh, next podcast. Probably be the draft preview as we get closer and closer. I'm not a mock guy. I don't do my mocks. I just tell you who I who I think is going to be there. So, uh, but if you got mocks, send them to me. You know, I, I like to read everybody's mocks and, and go over them and see if they're similar to what I think is going to happen. We got a lot to go. This is April, but we're getting closer and closer to the draft. And hey. You know where you're going to hear, and I've made a, vi but hey, I've made a commitment. You're going to hear from me every single day. 
podcast back next week. Every day I'm everywhere you can find me. Facebook.com slash Mr. Chuck Knox. Twitter at Chuck Knox. TikTok at Chuck Knox. Instagram at Chuck Knox. And of course, YouTube where I'm already rolling out videos. Mr. Chuck Knox. Thank you guys so much, seriously, for listening to this podcast. I'm going to try and roll these out more frequently here in the off season so that we're we're here multiple times a week come the season start. And I just want to say thank you so much for constantly staying with me, allowing me to be part of your Giants life, your routines. I can't tell you guys how humble that makes me. I do this for the fans. That's strictly what I do this for. I'm just a massive fan, and I have the privilege and the honor of being somewhat of a voice for this fan base. So just want to say thank you to everybody for a tremendous season, and I look forward to so much going forward in the off season. We got just this is just April. We're just we're just kicking off this shit in April. So much to go. Draft, free agency still going on. Training camp, who knows what else? There's uh, links. You know where to find me. You'll see me. You'll hear me again very shortly. And until then, Giants fans, I'll see you real soon. For now, I am. Out.